Good evening. <clears throat> Good evening, members and guests. I was told not to tell you too much about what they're going to talk, but I'm going to give you a little um, introduction about this. First of all, I mean, you probably know that Dr. Chris is um, <clears throat> um, the editor of Journal of Time Society, and both of them had received the prizes in FOCA a few years ago. Now, Lilith Pralor is one of the most loved and also the most admired um, Thai lit oh, classic Thai literature. This book took them five years to translate, as well as Toa Tosama, the other one. Now, Lilith Pralor is about tragic love story. The details will come up in the book, and also they will tell you. The story took place in prayer, and you have heard about prayer recently because a beautiful Bombay Burma building was torn down. Now, beside what's going on in, temporary, in the contemporary world at the moment, this classic love story is not about passion, but also tell us about human behavior, how the kings or royals are all too human, and it's about facts of life about Buddhist teachings. Then the other one, Toa Tosamad, which is a fancy word for 12 months. Let's go through the whole year with the metaphor of seasons and seasonal changes of love and lament, of longing, of the lost love. Now, please welcome to the stage, Dr. Chris Baker and Dr. Pasuk Pong Pajit. Thank you very much. Thank you, Tom, for your very kind introduction. And good evening, everyone. To begin with, I would like some help from the audience. I want the Thai in the audience to help me recite a bit of a Thai poem, which I think you all know it. It starts like this. Siang le siang lao ang andai Siang yom yo yot krai tuala Song ke pi la play lum tun re pi Song pi kit eng a very good. <laughs> you know very well. Of course, it's from Lilith Pralor, and it's one of the best known Thai classics. But can I ask you another question? Who here has read Tawa Tosamat? Please. Raise the hand. Hmm. Mm, okay, you don't need the next question. <laughs> None. <laughs> we have translated these two poems in this book. One of them is very well known. The other is now almost unknown. But that was not always so. I'm economist. Chris is a historian. What are we doing translating these classics, Thai classics? We both love reading. We both love classics because they have big themes, love, conflict, our common humanity. And Thai has some great classics, but they are hidden by their language. Ten years ago, we translated the tale of Kun Chang Kun Pan, a great and tragic love story. We now working on the earlier, on the earliest translated as Thai, the, the earliest Thai classics from around 1500. Our new book 
has both Lilith Plala and Tawar Tosmat translated. The letter is translated as 12 months, as uh, Tom said. And Silkworm has also published another translation of Lilith Plala by Professor Robert Bittner, Bittner from the University of Wisconsin. We plan to launch them together, but Professor Bickner uh, got stuck in the US because of COVID. Um, maybe we can organize this later. So today, oh, there is also a Chinese translation of Pralaw. This is one of the co-translators that we met in Beijing, Xiong Ruan from Peking University. And maybe we can get her to come too when we do Lilith Paro later. But today, we would only do Tawa Tosomat for you today, something new for you. And so over to Chris. OK. We are going back now 500 years, to over 500 years, before Shakespeare, before America, before Australia, and a man in the old Siamese capital of Ayutthaya writes this. My sole young heart partner, surpassing words, best budding blue, my ten-touched care caressed, embraced your body's beauty, supped the finest taste, and never left you lone past half a watch. I miss your special, soft, sin sensuous tongue that fired my heart and roused my lust. I miss your scent, your dulcet voice divine, flesh pressed on tender flesh to seem as one. I miss the times of roving like a naga lord, my arms embracing, circling, coiling round the beauty of all beauties, passions, taste, Deep loving, sliding, winding, folding tight. I miss caressing. Golden lotus, holy lake. Dipping down past lily bud, parting petals wide. I miss my cherishing the perfect flower's crown. And prying part the flower whirl below Meru's mount. To bathe in Tavatimsa, lake of gods, is good. Yet equals not your crystal lake at watchbeat time. In heaven's lake, the nectar tastes sublime. But bathing in your lake eclipses all three worlds. Oh, listen, lovely lady, fair-eyed young. Though parted heart and soul, I stay with you. In every detail, perfect golden lotus mine. Am I lack love, lies lovely darling bud? There's five early Thai literary works which are well known. There's Yuan Pai, which is a, a battle story and a royal eulogy, which we <clears throat> published a couple of years ago. Twelve Months and Lilith Pralo, which are both on a love theme, which comes out now. <clears throat> we are working on the next one, which is Nirat Haripunchai. And the fifth one, Mahachak Kamluing, is the Wetzendorn story, and it's not so different from the modern version and may not be worth publishing. But our idea is to do all of these early Thai literary works. This one... Tawatotsamat, which is just the Bali for 12 months. It was composed in the late 15th century. And through most of the time until then, <clears throat> it was highly regarded and greatly play, praised. In Jindamani, which is a kind of literary manual in the 17th century, it was seen as the epitome of how you write this kind of poetry. The early 19th century was praised by the poets of the time, Bayatrang and Nainarin, who just, they praised it by copying it, you know, as a, an act of, uh, of homage. 
And in the late 19th century, one of the first editions was done by this man, Prince Samot Amorapan, who is a son of Kin Mongkut, and he was a manager of the private finance, the Patang Kang Ti, for King Chula Longkorn. And in 1904, it was published for the first time in Wachiriyan. And Wachiriyan is like the journal of the court intellectual elite. And this was one of the first poems that was published in this way. Coming to 1925, it was, came out in a Wachiriyan Library edition. Wachiriyan Library started as the Palace Library, became Wachiriyan, and then became the National Library. And these editions, which were published around this time, <clears throat> with prefaces by Prince Damron, became most of them became classics, printed over and over again, becoming textbooks for universities and schools. And Prince Damron's introductions, prefaces, also became classics. Not this one. At this point, this book disappears. Prince Damron's preface was just four lines, and it's never been reproduced. This edition was never reprinted. It's very hard to find. I've only found two copies in libraries in Thailand. It was only reprinted once by a private publisher, and that's lost completely. There doesn't seem to be any surviving copy. <clears throat> King Rama VI formed this, a literary society, which basically created the canon of Thai literature by selecting certain works and saying, these are the superb works of Thai literature. Most of those early ones that I mentioned just now were chosen, not this one. And when he started writing textbooks for the study of literature in schools and universities in the 1930s and 1940s, this book is hardly mentioned at all. So it's been disappeared. Right? <clears throat> then, so the first academic edition is not done out of the universities at all, but it's done by this extraordinary man, Chantit Gasehsin, who was born in Hoahin, but before there was a palace, before there was a railway, before there was a golf course, it was a little fishing village. His father was a businessman who went broke. He did about five years in the local school, then ran away to Bangkok, became an extraordinary journalist, writing under enormous numbers of pen names and all kinds of uh, uh, different publications, and also edited the first editions of many of Thai literary works. But when he edited this one and he tried to get it published, he couldn't. All the, pu the major publishers refused him. In the end, he got it printed by the jobbing printer at the Baksoi, you know, the kind of people who do calendars and that sort of and name cards and so on. And he said, it was amazing that she did this, thinking, given that she wasn't ever going to make a profit, when even the great printing houses, which directly dominate the market for student publications, do not dare to publish this. And from then on until very recently, there has been <coughs> just one academic thesis from Chula Longkorn University in 1973, and there was just one academic article in 2005. So hardly paid any attention to at all. So very famous for 400 years, disappeared completely. <coughs> so what is it? Okay. It's a poem of 260 verses of four lines, like the ones I led to you. And it's a lament for a lost love, which goes across a year, beginning in March, April, and each month is like a canto. It's, and all of the addresses are addressed to her. It's like he's sending her a tweet or an Instagram or whatever every couple of, couple of days. And it divides uh, pretty easily into three, three parts. This is not in the original, but it's our way of analyzing that, them. And the first part of those is based fundamentally about grief. And it, she's left him. She's gone away. We don't, know, we don't know where. We just know that he's now on his own, and he's very, very upset indeed. And it starts in March, April, in the hot season. So he uses the metaphor of the heat and the withered vegetation and the cracked earth for how he feels. 
The sun ascends and stirs the sky alive. Sun's rays flood forth and fill the firmament. The moon, blaze battered, begs for life. And yet, its pain is less than pain that parting brings. A thousand suns, bright shining rays that scorch three worlds and torch all things. Destroy the triple spheres in flaring flames, yet equal not the heat of parting you, princess. And he uses this image of the destruction of the world at the end of a Buddhist era when the seven suns rise and the whole world has been... He he uses this metaphor throughout. It gives this sense of the subjection of humanity to the power of nature. After a couple of months, the rain starts falling like we are now. And then, of course, the rain becomes the simile, the metaphor for his tears. Since I was parted from you far and long, the grumbling sky declaims its doleful gloom. The breezes blow, bring flowing, flooding rains. The heavens' restless rage compounds my grief. My skin and hair are dry and red. My breast is hot and bothered, back aboard. Heaven's greenish belly growls and groans. Dream days, I wheel, wail and weep in welling streams. He, he pays almost no, in this first part, pays almost no attention to the outside world. He's either talking about the weather and moaning about he feels almost continuously. Except that he has memories of her. And some of these are the memories of his, their lovemaking. I miss the taste of love, your body's every part. The pause before possessing you on fire. Oh, gem princess, my fort of fount of fortune, oh, please share your body, part placed in my heart. But some of the memories are completely trite. I mean, he can't get her out of his mind. So he just remembers things like this, when she throws some petals in the air, and he can remember her, her fingernails glinting. You slip slid from my side and gave great grief. Apart afar, I cry myself husk horse. Oh, young, full-blooming jewel, elegant of limb, I'm left bereft of joy and quick for love. So, what is the origin of this poem? Who wrote it, when, and perhaps why? Most of these early Thai poems, we have no idea who write them. There's no authorship written. There's actually no title or anything either. But at this one, at the end, there's a verse about the authorship. And the Thai scholars believe this is genuine. Okay? And it says, The cantos of this verse by one sole poet were composed, the young king who's beside three worlds. Illustrious kun prom montri si kawirat and san prasert helped polish and refine this verse. Now, these three names at the end, Promontory, Kawirat, and San Prasert, they are titles of court poets. So, as he says, they helped him to, to polish it up. The important part here is this. By one sole poet, the young king, who's beside three worlds. So, three worlds is Dry Lom. So, the king here is probably King Baromat, And we know from the chronicles that in 1463, he went to rule from Pitsanulo because he was fighting a war against Lana. And when he did that, he put a relative of his called Boromaracha onto the throne in Ayutthaya. So the Thai scholars who've recently studied this think the young king who's beside three worlds is Boromaracha, who's beside Trilokana, okay, who is the relative of Trilokana. It's usually considered that Boromaracha was his son, but this team, which I'll talk about later, thinks it's more likely he was a younger brother because they had two sons who were ordained together, which suggests their ages were not too far apart. But actually, there's another possibility And that's this, that the Chinese records, so that later, 20 years later, in the 1480s, Drylokonat, he abdicated and went into the monarchy and passed over the, 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 the throne to his son. 
And Sankitya Vamsa, which is a chronicle written in Bali, says that he was succeeded by his son, Intaracha, who at that time was aged about 16. And I must confess, I think it's this one rather than the early one, because I think this is the sort of poem that was written by someone who was in the age 16 to 20, 25, around that period. <clears throat> we know also that the lover, the girl, she was also royal. We know that because the language used to describe her is, is often royal language. And at one point, he calls her Si Julalak, and that is title in, in, the, in the Three Seals Law, in the records of the time, that's the title of one of the four primary queens at, at a certain time. Now, we can't be sure because the usage of these terms changed from reign to reign, but it's very likely that she was one of the primary queens. He doesn't tell us that much about her, except the obvious. He tells us she's very beautiful, she's slender, she's young, and she's elegant, except at two places he says she has these extraordinary blue eyes, and he compares them to the anchan, the, the, the butterfly pea, this very, uh, very vibrant blue flower on a creeper. Um, and of course, nobody in Southeast Asia has blue eyes. So where does she come from? And one other point, he also talks of foreign gold when he, he may be referring to her complexion. So we wonder if she was some consort from somewhere, from Persia or somewhere, which was presented to the king in Ayutthaya at this time. We can't find any records, but it's a, it's a lovely speculation that she's a very exotic lady as well. Okay. We now come to the second part of the thing. And this is when he, he's, he's, he's trying to search for her. He's sort of searching for her in all kinds of, of different ways. Okay? Um, and th when he's searching for her, he conjures up images from the past over and over. The month Vesaka roars, the heavens pour. I miss the flowers, garlands, places of yours. This season's love, your belly, utmost joy. My belly, hot and hurt against your navel's bud. You wove some petals, love, recall the day. Wind swirled them up and strew them across the sky. Your fingernails up high like nine gems glittering. I see each nail, my jewel, paint pattern gold. This very trite image, but he, it just sort of comes into his mind one day. So he, he writes it into the poem. And he also imagines her turning up in the present day. Through this sixth month, I've wailed and wept no end. This season, country folk all plough the earth. Atop a plough's upcurving shaft, a flag there flaps. I think your hand is beckoning me and race behind. I reach the flag and it's not you. I fall, unsettled, hot, love-hungry, racked by fear. The flapping plough flag as seen afar is not your hand, your face, but just a plough. And he starts to get very angry. So he starts to accuse the gods of taking her away from him. I fear the gods, both great and small, are grieved that I should drown so deep in you. Perhaps the king of gods has made us part and left me sad, sad, sorrowful, and sore. So he tries to bribe them. Oh, gods who made her disappear, show mercy once. I offer you a hundred thousand maidens, lords. For her, the single perfect treasured bloom of mine, I bow to offer you these fragrant gems divine. And throughout this period, he keeps asking over and over again, where have you gone? Where have you disappeared? Where are you hid? And he calls on all kinds of things, gods, birds, kites, everything, to send messages to her. And he keeps saying, the messages I send each day have you not seen. And also in this text, he starts to compare her to the moon, which of course is a great international symbol of beauty, purity, but also inconstancy. The white orb circles through the sky, is that your face? The rabbit marks a blemish, it's not you. Your beauty is pure, surpassing artistry, as limpid light as lotuses, sublime beyond the moon. 
and he has one lovely cup couplet which I particularly like. Although you left like the setting moon, you crossed sky's rim and failed to rise again. Okay. So, although not many scholars have studied this poem seriously until recently, a lot of people have said what they think it is. You know, they've sort of passed comment in it, and particularly they've assigned it to different genres of poetry or literature. And the most common one that it is assigned to is to be a treatise on royal ceremonies. Now, as we'll see in a minute, it does talk about royal ceremonies a bit, but they're very much in the background. They're not in the foreground. There are several treaties on royal ceremonies, and the confusion seems to come about because many of those treaties have 12 months in their title, particularly the famous one by King Chulalongkorn, Prarichapiti Pit Sipsong Bilen, the royal ceremonies of the 12 months. And there's an earlier one from the 19th century which has Tawatotsama in, in its title as well. Several people try to say it's a Nirat travel poem, which is a bit difficult because the Nirat travel poem, there's no travel in the poem, and Nirat travel poems weren't invented until about 200 years later. Some say it's just a salon exercise. Don't take it seriously. It's about the young king and this girl. It's just something that people did you know, in the salon to ent entertain themselves. Some say it's an emulation of Sanskrit literature, particularly Kalidasa and the lovely poem of the Cloud Messenger. And there, there's some echoes, but you can't find a single line that, are very, that is at, at all close. Some say it was composed solely to be a manual for other poets. Do you compose something like this? I don't know. It's extraordinary. And finally, it's, as people say, it, it's a philosophical philosophy philosophical discourse about man in nature. And what, of course, is striking about all these comments is that none has said this is an extraordinary poem written by a king about love. The third stage of the poem is about reconciliation, owning up to what has happened. And it starts when you get to the end of the year and the rains are stopping, and the, the sky is becoming bright again, and his mood changes. In Katika, the golden moon shines specially bright. Mid wisps of cloud against a limpid sky, the heaven's heart glows light and bright as clouds dispel. Yet my abandoned heart knows only scorching heat. And at this point, he does start to attend royal ceremonies. He is the king, after, after all. And particularly, he, he attends this ceremony called Butsia Pise, which is a ceremony which was sort of held almost every year, which is like a repeat. It's like a redo of, of, the, of the coronation. And it, it, it translates as flower anointment. So he writes... The flower anointment, praise and blessings. The chief and other twice born, the Brahmins, enter now to offer blessings, chants of om and eulogies. The ministers of ranks illustrious and overseers, the Mern and Kun all bow. So we're like this. He's in the audience hall. It's full of the entire elite, elite of a UTI society, but what's going on in his head? He's shouting to himself, oh, I care for you. Where have you gone to hide? He's not paying attention to the ceremony at all. And it sort of comes next when you come to the lantern festival. And this is a it's like Diwali. You have light, beautiful lights all over the palace. And he writes this. The strings of lanterns dangle down in rows. The pulleys groan like windmills turned by breeze. When raised, the lanterns spin. My heart sinks, missing you. The pulleys groans of passion leave me lonely low. In other words, when they haul up the lanterns, the pulleys are going, ah, ah, and he, all he can think of is her moans during lovemaking. And the same, the same thing happens with kites and other things at this time. And so when he gets the boat race, he's like this. The paddlers part the waters, fly downstream. They cant their oars, then plunge and pull with power. I ache afar from you with flooding eyes. Think back, recall the time of our first tryst. So all this 
all this energy being used and these paddles up in the air makes him think of the first time that they made love. And there's then a sort of crisis at this, in this, this section, which is wonderful. There's a big uh, <clears throat> firework ceremony, which is part of the, the flower anointment ceremony. And this is a critical time for him. Fire lilies, thunder in the skies. The sound of fireworks spreads across the earth. The rockets rise with sparkling colors, sizzling sounds. Or oh, is this noise my breast on fire, my heart? ablaze. And, and he, he has this sort of crisis and I think it's because the beauty that he sees in this fireworks, it reminds him so much of the beauty of his love with her, which is what he was describing at the beginning. But it's so ephemeral. It disappears in a minute and it's gone in ever, forever. So it emphasizes the beauty of the past and his total loss in the present. So he ends this section with one of the most poignant of the verses of the thing. Of you I miss each single thing of you and seethe and sob with no relief. Your perfect body's every part still flays my heart. Should all three worlds expire, this feeling would not fade. And this raises the question then, has she died? Most extraordinarily, none of the people <coughs> who have studied this poem or commented on this poem have raised the question, has she died? Well, when we were reading it, it seemed pretty obvious in the end that she had died. And the evidence is this, and that first is that when he's <coughs> complaining about the gods having taken her away, one of them is Yama, Yom, the, the god of death. At uh, Kalpansa. He, he makes merit in the temple and he says, I beg <clears throat> to send the merit to her made by these good works. And of course, this is what you do for someone who's recently died. You send the merit to ease their passage to a future life. And then towards the... Whoops! How did that happen? Oh, let me go back. Yeah. And then... Towards the end, he says, although if there's a life ahead, there may I meet my love. And again, this is a conventional sentiment that you wish to meet someone, your partner who has died, you wish to meet them in a future life. And then right at the end, he says, I wish to meet her in all of my future lives up until entering Nibbana. Again, it's a very conventional thing. So it seems extremely likely that she, in fact, has died. And <clears throat> in this last part, he starts to, he, he riffs about time, particularly. Or, wit, or watches for Thor pass by till evening comes. Each watch, a watch is three hours. Each watch, the times of day proceed in turn. The day you left, I spoke and spilled my heart, and weeping held you weeping to my breast till gone. And right at the end, the penultimate verse, he comes to terms with it all. And he says, this 12 is 12 of wretchedness, but love and happiness are found throughout the world. So, the, our ability to translate this, and, and if you like to unearth this poem a bit, um, has depended upon some very brilliant people. This book was printed three years ago, which is a new annotated edition of the work. And it was printed by the Princess Sirinthorn Anthropology Center, <clears throat> a very prestigious in institution. And the people behind it was a team of about 10, but the important ones are, th are these three. The first one is Drongjai Hutanguni. He's talked at the society here a couple of times. He, he talked about two years ago about Ptolemy's geography, and he actually brought along copies of this at that time. He's an extraordinary po polymath. The other two important ones are Winai Pongsi Pian, who's a historian with extraordinary talent in uh, old Thai languages, and Samer Bunma, who is a 
Pali Sanskritist. And between them, they have command of languages, which is able to interpret the, this old Thai much better than anyone has done before, and therefore we can use it. But all that, they also fabulously recognize that this, what this is. Uh, Dong Chai in his introduction says, this is one of the great works of old literature, which expresses the emotion of love through interplay between the joy of love and the pain of loss. And Samer also says, there's two reasons really why this has been neglected for the last hundred years. One of them is because the language is difficult. The other is because it got, it got pigeonholed as being erotic literature, as it deals with inappropriate matters, such as the private organs of men and women, and uses words for erotic effect. This is too much for Thai society, even though the poet disguises these with, with double meanings that readers <coughs> may not, in Thai fact, society know. At present, mm. at the time. But also, in this book, there's a lovely article by uh, Ajahn Sasidhorn, who is an anthropologist who works in Selapakon University. And what she says, more or less, is it's not surprising what is in here. This is about a, a man who is in, indulging in the emotion called passionate love. And by rejecting to, to, to pay attention, uh, Thai society is losing out in two ways. I mean, one, in being able to appreciate uh, the emotion of passionate love, and two, being able to understand that the Ayutthaya era was really quite different and the standards and the ways of talking about such things in that period were very different as well. So we think there's three reasons, really, three main reasons why this poem was disappeared for a hundred years. I mean, the first is that over that hundred years, the, there was a deliberate attempt to create a national literature with a, a moral purpose as part of the building of, of, of the national population. So that even to today, the rules for the book prizes given out by the Ministry of Culture uh, say that entries must be books that do not contravene morality and do not affect the security of the country. And the result of this is that love stories never win this, these book prizes. I mean, nor do science fiction and various other things. And publishers have had to create other prizes to get round it. And the second reason is that there is a very strong feeling that strong emotions should be controlled. This is summed up in all kinds of publications and all kinds of epithets. And one of the most co common is this phrase from Madama Pada, which says, the wise are controlled in bodily action, controlled in speech, and controlled in thought. They are truly well controlled. But in this poem, the author is indulging the very strong emotion of grief and the very strong emotion of passionate love. And that's his reason for writing the poem, which is, goes very much against this idea. And the third is this self-portrayal of the king's humanity. If you go back, we think, to early Ayutthaya, uh, kingship was really quite different. You know, we, you can't tell, there's not much evidence to, to, build, on, to build on. But from the 17th century, there's this effort to build a Thai absolutism, which involves making the king superhuman, right? raising him completely above the, the normal life and separating him from normal humanity. And although there's been changes in that over the, over the years since then, it's still basically there. But in this poem, the king as author is presenting himself as not only human, but nakedly human in both a kind of physical and emotional sense. And you can see why that is very difficult for certain people to take. Finally, if, as we suspect, she has died, then that means this poem is an elegy, because elegy is the name 
for poems of grief about those who have died in the Western tradition. And there's also some Eastern ones as well. Very interesting Japanese ones. Um, and in fact, it's one of the biggest categories, genres of poetry in the Western tradition. And therefore, it's much studied. So I had great fun reading all, all of this. And what you discover is that 12 months, Tawa Totsama, fits in the analysis of Western elegies incredibly well in at least three ways. The first is that there's a background of, of nature. Right? And this is common for the Western and a course for this, which is arrayed around the, the seasons changing of the year. And in the academic analysis, this is explained that this is an assurance of continuity. Life, the world will go on, even though there's been a great tragedy of a certain person's death. The second reason is this three-phasing of, 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 the, of, of the poem, which, in which I've presented just now, and which we presented in, in, in SOAS in London three years ago, is, is absolutely the model for how elegies are written. And it, uh, it's described often by a very famous article written by Freud about how people overcome grief in these three stages. And the third similarity is that elegies use a certain uh, range of figures of speech, pathetic fallacy, apostrophe, outbursts of anger, and you find all of these in this poem again. The fit is quite extraordinary. I, I was amazed when we found it. And probably this, if we look, looking to elegy too, is the best way to explain how it came about that the young king who's beside three worlds, a young king in Ayutthaya, 500 years, should come to write such a remarkable work. And I think this comes in what Tennyson wrote in the, the wonderful In Memoriam, Memoriam about his grief over the his death of his friend Hallam when he wrote, I do but sing because I must. In other words, he's so driven by the emotion. And I think probably that is the best way to explain how a king of Ayutthaya 500 years ago should come to write such an extraordinary work about passion and grief, about love and loss. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Hello. Hello, 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 okay. Thank you very much, Dr. Chris and Dr. Paso. Please uh, raise your hand if you have any questions. This seems like an Ayutthaya version of Orpheus and Eurydice. Yeah, it's quite simple. I can't, we can't hear. Uh, Um, the, uh, certainly in the early part, in the, the part of the extreme grief, I, I think that's true. Uh, there's also, after the end of the 12 months, there's a bit which the students of, 
uh, elegy called CODA, you know, the, as, it, as, as in music, which is kind of like reviewing uh, the whole thing. And, the and in the climax of that, he imagines himself flying up through the sky to meet the gods and to, to negotiate with them uh, directly in a, in a, in a, a very e e extraordinary image, which I think is very good. Uh, on on the, the, the translation and the hyphens and all of that stuff, if you go to the Thai original, um, the, the old Thai of, of, of this period is almost like telegraphies. You know, it, it's, it's man eat cat, you know, man buy, boy eat dog, you know. So, um, so you, you have to do quite a lot of, uh, of massaging to bring it to life. Um, and our rules in, in doing this was that, you know, you can sort of add auxiliary words to make the English play, but we cannot add a, a noun or a verb or an adjective. I mean, you, you, so you can't sort of cha change the meaning. But then what we, you have to do, and, and, and you may not have noticed, but it's, it's rendered in blank verse. It's rendered in Shakespearean blank verse. So in order to fit that, then you, you, you have to play around a bit. So we in, just like Shakespeare, we invent lots of words, you know, but invent words that uh, should be understandable because they're using parts of other words, which we, we all know. Anyone else? <coughs> One more. Hello. <coughs> the the idea of twelve months. Uh, a, a Western idea uh, or independent Thai idea and to talk of elegy are you meaning that there is a tradition of elegy or you're bringing the concept of elegy to impose over it or did it was it inspired by some tradition of elegy either Western or Thai, because if, if the 12 months is a Western 12 months, then maybe some other ideas crept in? No, the, the, the calendar it uses is the Thai calendar, which also has 12 months and, and has had for as long as anyone can remember. So uh, there's... And at this period, you cannot... There's certainly no West to East influence on anything literary at all. We are back, you know, before, before the voyages, right? We're back before the Portuguese get here. So there's, there's no literary influence that has come at all. So all we are saying by saying that it conforms to elegy is that it, it has the same form, it has the same, uh, has many of the same aspects, which merely says that writers in different cultures react particularly to these you know, very primary experiences of life, you know, grief, grief over death, in rather similar ways, which is not really very surprising. Thank you. Yes. Any more questions? Please. Or comments? If not, um, thank you very much, Dr. Chris Baker and Dr. Pasuk. May I ask um, the present and the future, well, the <coughs> outgoing and incoming pres presidents of the Sam Society to present the garland and the bouquet of flowers to the speakers.